Dear family in Christ, please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we give thanks to you for the grace that you have poured out upon us, that you have shown us from your Son, Christ Jesus, in heaven, and that you have shined forth forevermore in our lives. We pray that each and every day, as your family, that we would be those who resemble you, that would reflect you, that would live lives that share you with others. We pray this through your Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. As all of you know, or most of you know, last week, uh, Carla and I had a chance to go see our family. And as you know, our family is, most of it is on the other side of the country. Uh, my parents quite literally in Baltimore. Carla's uh, in Michigan, so at least 2,000 miles away. And so we don't often get to see them. So one of the things Carla does on a regular basis, uh, for a while there it was a daily basis, now it's about a weekly basis, sometimes it's a little longer, is she sends out pictures or videos through her phone so that our families will see as Jacob grows and as he develops that they'll be able to see him grow and develop. And so she'll send out a picture of when he started crawling or, uh, or a video when he started crawling. She send him, sent them a recording of his babbling, other things like that so that, well, they would see his, the changes. Well, my parents, being the proud parents they are, and my mom being the gregarious woman she is, well, she had to share these pictures with everyone. And when I say everyone, I am not overstating it at all. She would share these pictures at this time. At that time, she was working at Walmart as a, as a cashier, and she would share the pictures with every person who would look at them in line. Okay. Well, one day, she was sharing the pictures of Jacob, and this was about a year, a year and a half ago, so Jacob was about six months. And she shared the picture with this one lady, and being a nice person that she was, she said to my mom, Wow, he looks just like his grandma. Okay, when my mom told me that story, I was a bit puzzled. I, I admit that, and I actually laughed, and I said, well, wait a minute now, uh, was she looking at your phone or not? Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized maybe there is some truth to that lady's statement. You know, Jacob has good looks, I think, and, uh, and those come from his birth parents, his birth mom and birth dad. He, he doesn't look exactly like Carla. He doesn't look exactly like me. His skin is a little darker, his eyes are darker, his hair is darker. But, you know, there are certain things that when I look at him, I see Carla, and I see myself. When I look at his smile, I see my smile. When I look at some of the expressions on his face, I see Carla's expressions, and I think to myself, well, those are good expressions for him to pick up, and some not so good. But, so I kind of understood maybe what that lady was talking about. Maybe she wasn't saying that his skin looked the same as his grandma or that his eyes were, were blue like hers, which they aren't. But perhaps she was saying, I can see you through the smile, through the, his mannerisms, just like I can see myself in Jacob, just like, just like I can see Carla in Jacob. And so as I thought about that, it kind of made me think that it's not, we're not unique in this way. Our family is not alone in this way. And when you think about your own families, think about them for just a minute. How many of you, if you've been married for a long time, you can complete each other's sentences? Some of you, even you, you get the same facial expressions as, as one another. How many of your kids talk like you? They, they have the same mannerisms as you. I think if you think about it for a moment, you'll realize how, many there, that, how much that is true. And I thought if that's true, it's also true of our heavenly family, our church family. We have been brought into the same family and while we don't look exactly like God, we bear his resemblance. Let me read to you again from Galatians chapter 4. I love this text. It's Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, so you have that in front of you. And it's that reminder of how we got brought into the family. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. That we might receive adoption as sons. That's how we became part of God's family. We don't ha share anything biologically with him. We don't, uh, we don't look like him in any way. You're not going to get to heaven and say, now I know where I got my nose from. We don't look like God in that way, but we do bear his resemblance. When we talk about that, we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 where it says that we were brought forth in the image of God, both male and female. The imagio dei is the fancy Latin phrase, but really what that's talking about is that we share the likeness of how God thinks, how God looks at the world, how God acts is how we're meant to think, how we're meant to look at the world, how we're meant to act. When you think about that, that means that when people look at us, they're meant to see God. When we smile, they're meant to see God smiling. When we laugh, they're meant to know that God has a sense of humor. 
Just look at me. When we look at, when we show kindness to someone else, they're meant to see that it's the same kindness God has shown to us. When we show love to someone else, they are meant to know that it is coming from God's love. In fact, we have the greatest example of love of all time. Because we know that that adoption that we have as sons and daughters did not come freely, but it came because of Jesus' death on the cross. That great act of love, that great act of adoption, by his very blood, he made us part of the inheritance, blood relatives, part of the family. God chose you. That's pretty incredible stuff when you think about it for just a minute. Because out of all the many millions and billions of people who live on this earth, God chose you. God made you part of his family. And as part of his family, we're meant to show him to others. We're meant to live as part of the family so all people might know how much God loves them. The compassion he's showing us, they are meant to know as well. But so often it's hard to do that. So often it's hard for us to be those who are resembling God in the lives that we live. And I could go through a list of things, and maybe I will a couple of those things. But when you think about it, think of all the things, all the ways in which you don't resemble God. Think about those ways where sometimes you worry more about the things of this earth than about your own soul, about your place before God. Think about those times where you look at the rising gas prices, the rising, the rising food prices, the, the incomes that have remained the same. And you don't think about the inheritance God has given you or that all gifts come from God. How many of you worry constantly about politics, worry about who's in the White House or who's on, in Congress or in the Senate? Isn't God in control of all things? Isn't that what we confess? How many of us at times worry about our health, our, our well-being, our medical appointments, our, our needs? And don't think about the many years that God has given us of life, of health, and of the blessings. You know, so often it's hard for us to be reflectors of God's love, to be those images of God to the people on earth. So often it's hard for us because we get caught up in our own sins. We get caught up in, in our own problems and our own difficulties. And those things are important. Don't think that I'm saying they're not important because it is important that we, are, that we think about how we spend our money, the way we live our lives, uh, how we take care of our bodies. But those things are secondary to the most important thing, being those who reflect God to the world. Because the world is lost and dying without Him. The world is lost and dying without the promise of salvation. The world is lost and dying, and they do not know what it means to be adopted as sons and daughters of God. Maybe it's important that we remember what that's like. None of you remember your birth. But when you think about someone who is born illegitimately, there's a stigma that follows them. We were illegitimate children. We were illegitimate, illegitimate, illegitimate children who did not have a family, who did not have a home, who had not been chosen. We were people who were bound by our sin, who were overcome by our sin. Just look again at Galatians 3, the end of 3 and the beginning of 4 there. We were at one time underneath that burden of sin until we've been set free by Christ. But unless we think about that, unless we think about the stranglehold that sin has on us, what it means to be an orphan apart from God, then we won't see how important it is that other people know that God is choosing them. It's pretty painful to think about not being wanted. It's pretty painful to think of someone rejecting you. That's the beauty of knowing that God did choose you. That God chose you to be his very own son or very own daughter. That God chose you to be one of his children. To be those who are part of his family. When we look at those verses, verses in Galatians, we see that it's not by a biological choosing. For a long time, the, the, the Hebrew people, the Israeli people, and then the Jewish people, they thought it was about biology. It was about the fact that they were part of Abraham's seed. Jesus says no. Well, God says no, it's about Jesus. It's about faith in him. It's about having that seed in him. We have been made sons and daughters through him. 
We have been welcomed into the family through Him. And so that influences how we act towards each other. That influences the way that we respond to others. Whether it be showing love to others, showing that compassion. Whether it be admitting when we're wrong. Whether it be say, uh, offering an apology. Or accepting an apology. Whether it be reaching out a hand to help someone else. Changing our views of asking whether or not someone deserves our love. Instead asking, does God love them? Shouldn't I too? And living as those people we have been made to be. Because that's what we do together as a family. That's what we do together as a family of God. We come together so that we might learn together, so that we might grow together, so that we might exhibit those same mannerisms as our Father in Heaven. We don't just come to church and call it the family of God and then leave and then forget about it until next Sunday. But being part of the family of God means that each and every day that, we are, that it changes the attitude and the way that we live in the world. It means that it changes the way that we treat those in this church and outside of this church. It means, it means that we show God to those who we don't think deserve it. That we show God to those who we wouldn't otherwise do so. And that we show, God, show them that God is love. You know, that's, there's a story that Dr. Fred Craddock told, tells. Dr. Craddock actually is almost into retirement now, but he, he taught homiletics. Not in the Lutheran Church, but, uh, but he, many of his books are, are good, good uh, books for learning about preaching. And he tells a story about one time when he was lecturing at Yale University. He and his wife had taken some time off and gone down to Tennessee, and they just wanted a private weekend together. They sat down to dinner, and as they were eating their dinner, they were at a nice restaurant, there was a white-haired gentleman going around from table to table to table and introducing himself, saying hi, and greeting everybody, asking them where they were from. Dr. Craddock admits that he whispered to his wife, I hope he doesn't come to our table. No sooner had he whispered that to his wife than, of course, this white-haired gentleman wanders over to their table. He gets to their table and he says, Hey, how y'all doing? They said, well, okay. Where y'all from? Well, Oklahoma. But, well, what brings you to Tennessee? Well, we're on vacation here. I'm a, I teach homiletics. I teach preaching to preachers. And this white-haired old gentleman looked at him and said, Well, so you teach preachers. Well, I have a story for you. And he gets into the story, and Dr. Craddock admits that he doesn't remember if he actually groaned out loud or if he just uh, if he groaned inwardly. But he he groaned, and because he's, he's heard many preacher stories. But he gets into the story. He goes and he goes, and he starts talking. He said, "When I was a young boy, I didn't know who my father was. My mother, she had me out of wedlock. When I went to school, the kids picked on me. They were really mean to me. They." even to the point where at recess I would go off by my, on my own. As I, got, as I got older, I realized how much people looked at me because he was from a small town. How much they stared at me. They're searing glances saying, well, who is his father? One day he was at church. This white-haired gentleman, when he was 12 years old, was at church. A new preacher had been called to the parish, and he went through the end of the service so quickly that this white-haired gentleman couldn't get out before, well, before the greeting time. You see, he had made it a habit because of everybody who stared at him, sneaking out the back as fast as he could. But this preacher got to the back before he did. Finally, this white-haired gentleman, as he walked up to the preacher, he had a little something in his throat. He kind of swallowed that, and the preacher said, Boy, put his hand on his throat, Whose are you? Whose son are you? That white-haired gentleman he said, great, one more person who's judging me because I don't have a father. He didn't say that out loud. He just thought that. But then that preacher looked at him. He said, oh, I know. I see the resemblance now. <laughs> You're the son of God. And you've got a great inheritance. Go claim it. This is a true story. That man was Ben Hooper. He was one of two governors of Tennessee that were illegitimate, but went on to be governors. See, that reminder of who we are is important because it changes who, how we live, the way we lead our lives. It changes the way we treat each other. It changes the way that we share with one another and the way we care for one another. 
says the people of God, how is God using you? As an adopted son or as an adopted daughter, how is God using you right now where you're at? Think about that this week. Think about the way that God might use you to show that same love, that same love that you were shown on the cross when God broke down the barrier through his son Jesus. Remember that love and remember whose you are. Remember that it is not as though your na- God's name is written on the outside, but written right across your heart that he has claimed you as his very own. Remember that and share that. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that as your family, that you have bought us with the price of your blood, that you have redeemed us. We pray that you would now use us to share your love and share your message with others. That we too might share that message of adoption so that all people might come to the knowledge of the truth. Lord, we ask that you would guide and direct our, the way that we speak to one another, the way that we treat one another, so that all people may see your smile, they, they may hear your laughter, that they may know your love and they may know your compassion and know that it is you. No matter what tragedies we go through this, in this life, no matter what worries come our way, may we resemble you. May we bear that family resemblance of you, our Father in heaven. This we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen.